no, unquestionably, there were horrible, horrible things. But if you if you looked under the hood just a little bit, you could see that they were mostly funded by uh, the United States and or her allies. The More Freedom Foundation podcast brought to you by Robert Morris. Uh, good morning, Rory. How's it going? Um, good afternoon, Rob. It's going very well. How have you been? Uh, not bad. Not bad. I'm uh, trying to... Trying to understand inflation statistics. Uh, just a day or so back, we got a inflation read, uh, and I I'm just not one of those people who can really ever understand what these things are saying. Uh, but uh, my understanding from a number of economists is that this is the third inflation reading in a row. They come out monthly. That looks pretty good, actually. Have you heard what the economist David McWilliams thinks of economists? I've not, actually. He thinks a lot of them deliberately make it complicated because it was, like, respected, you know, in the 1800s, and then all these sciences took off. So he thinks they deliberately make it over the top to make themselves feel more important. Ah, uh, the excessive the excessive over-quantification or what have you. Yes, but he thinks, um, you know, kind of... You know, theoretically, there's like a magical price thing should be. So once inflation goes up enough, it kind of gets close to this magical area. And it would appear that we are getting close to that. So hopefully this year may not be as bad as being predicted. Here's here's hoping. Here's hoping. But today I want to talk about something else that is something that... Uh, rep- phantomed away? Well, it's something that's phantomed away, but it, 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 more specifically, something that uh, Republicans talk a ton about that actually turned out to not be as big a deal as they claimed. Uh, and and that would be... Marlon Manson? Uh, no, it would... Oh, wow, I'd forgotten about that guy entirely. No, it's, it, it's actually going to be uh, international jihadism. Oh, something even worse than Marlon Manson. Yes, I mean, and and that's true. It's a it's a real thing. There were real organizations did international attacks of various sorts, uh, undermined a number of countries. But this idea that it was going to be some kind of enduring threat or real problem in the 21st century, I think, is really faded. Uh, and also, the idea that the U.S. government was going to really do anything about it is also something that's been kind of disproved. It did seem just like a perfect mix of fear, but also something that realistically was never going to totally destroy America, if that makes any sense. So you can constantly say, look at these horrible things, but in safe knowledge that it'll never come back on you. Exactly. And it's horrible. Unquestionably, there were horrible, horrible things. But if you if you looked under the hood just a little bit, you could see that they were mostly funded by uh, the United States and or her allies, specifically Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf monarchies. The CIA wouldn't do anything like that. True, true enough, true enough. I don't want to go, I think people can go a little bit too far in that direction, talking about how... Oh yeah, you blame everything in the world that's gone wrong on the CIA because they do act in the shadows. There are limitations where you can sort of definitely say, yes, they were here and funding bad boys. Exactly. The CIA is neither omniscient nor omnipotent, but if you look at radical jihadism, the galaxy of belief systems and militias that came out of Saudi Arabia, uh, the CIA had a pretty heavy hand in uh, promoting that ideology, both before 9-11, famously in the 1980s in Afghanistan, and in the broader Arab world to get people to go fight in Afghanistan. Uh, and then actually after 9-11, which is particularly shameful. Uh, I think some people go go too far and are like, oh, so that was, you know, the reason why 9-11 is an inside job, and I would, I would never go that far. But it, it's just simply true that the United States was in bed with radical jihadist elements before 9-11 and kind of eagerly got back into bed with radical jihadist ele- elements after 9-11. Well, I thought, did it not go into uh, another gear after the 11th of September? In, were you talking about U.S. support or talking about... Yeah, because you're, you're funding someone that's an enemy of your enemy, so it all works out well in the end, that sort of philosophy? Well, that was sort of the philosophy. I, I'm not sure it was adequately communicated to the American people the extent to which the war in Syria was about 
getting in bed with Al Qaeda and Al Qaeda adjacent elements. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of enemy, I and mean, that's the whole point. That's the reason why radical jihadism exists. That's the reason why in the 1970s and 1980s, the United States got in bed with a bunch of medieval monarchies who funded and created uh, the elements of um, uh, jihadism. The whole point was that these guys were helpful against the Soviet Union. Even in the 1970s, uh, from the framework of uh, government bureaucrats and U.S. government bureaucrats in the 1970s, it was pretty clear that Saudi Arabia was kind of gross uh, and their opinions on a range of things were quite different. Uh, just the fact that, you know, they're big into monarchy. That's not traditionally something that uh, the United States is into, their treatment of women. Well, here. I remember at the end of uh, World War II, America was very big on destroying the Japanese monarchy because it's sort of seen as something they're dead against, while the UK oddly thought it was a nice idea to keep a monarchy about that didn't really do much. <laughs> I wonder I wonder why the UK would feel that. Uh, but but obviously the um, even I mean what what goes on in Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf countries is significantly more extreme than I would I would say significantly more extreme than even the imperial Japanese model in the 1920s and 1930s. Yeah, it's it it, it is a heavily absolute a, a set of heavily absolute monarchies. Uh, I I don't use the term medieval lightly. I use it a lot when I apply it to these these countries. All of that was squashed. All of that was looked beyond, in part because of oil, of course, but also because the idea of Islamic religious fundamentalism was very appealing to United States policymakers who wanted to fight against the Soviet Union. the The Soviets were godless. The Soviets were were atheists and it seemed very straightforward to make common cause with these religiously fundamentalist focused uh, Gulf monarchies in the late Cold War. Isn't that why American money says in God we trust? It only came about in the 50s. It's not something that's always been on the money. Exactly. That's my understanding. My understanding is that it was an Eisenhower thing. To fight communism? Yeah, 1952 or, or thereabouts. It became a very big part of uh american ideology just to to make a firmer contrast against the communists and getting closer to islamic fundamentalists uh was part of that and not just in terms of this does predate the 70s in certain ways it was only in the 70s that we started eagerly applying uh saudi money uh, saudi ideology in places in central asia uh, in Afghanistan and to a limited extent in the, the what became the stands, the parts of the Soviet Union, in an effort to create division and make things harder for the Soviet Union. E even today, Russia, I believe the uh, population of Russia today is 20% Islamic. And when it included the predominantly Islamic countries of Central Asia, the Soviet Union had a higher uh, percentage. Actually, probably Ukraine balanced it out. But uh, it was a big deal, and it was a weapon that the United States wanted to use. And even as staunch and anti-interventionist as I am, and knowing the horrors that this brought about with 9-11, it's hard for me to say that it was the wrong choice, because it did contribute to ending the Soviet Union. But is it possible the Soviet Union was rotten from within and it would have inevitably fallen apart? I think that's true. But again, that's with hindsight. That's what we've we've learned in in the years since and by the fact that it just collapsed that way. Are you going under the idea of matching military budgets? So the Soviet Union was trying to match America and eventually bankrupted itself? I, I think that's a little oversold. I think that the Volcker shock probably had more to do with the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, we had hyperinflation in, actually probably hyperinflation is not the technically correct term. We had very high inflation in the United States and the broader developed world in the 1970s. 
uh, Paul Volcker, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, uh, appointed and encouraged by Jimmy Carter, actually, uh, dramatically hiked interest rates to the point where my interest rate on a savings account when I opened my first one in 1988 was like 18%. The, ba the bank was giving me 18%. So in making that incredible hike in interest rates, um, it wasn't quite, the world wasn't quite as intertwined as it is today, uh, where if the Fed raises interest rates, everybody else basically has to, or their economies fall apart. But it was something to that degree. So economic activity worldwide came to a stuttering crash. That's where we got all manner of emerging economy debt crises, like Latin America, the 1980s were like a lost decade because the money that they'd borrowed at, at uh, lower rates in the 70s was too expensive to pay back in the 1980s. And specifically, this massive engineered economic crash that the United States Federal Reserve put together in the late 1970s, early 1980s, crashed the oil price. And by the 1970s and 1980s, the Soviet Union was incredibly dependent on the world price of oil, as is Russia today. And I think that probably had a little bit more to do uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union than Reagan's defense hikes, but I haven't made as close a study of it as, as I'd like. I can see why the Carter and the Reagan administrations really doubled down on Saudi Arabia and Islamic fundamentalism, uh, even knowing the horror that it led to. What I find a lot harder to justify is the Obama administration's choice to double down on Islamic fundamentalism. This is a choice that is pretty largely backed uh, by the Trump administration, though with some caveats, um, though the details of it, they didn't change too much. Uh, is essentially, yeah, to take out uh, Assad, uh, the Obama administration, 2011, 2012, uh, 2013, uh, just started heavily, heavily funding uh, a lot of the jihadist elements that we were nominally at the same time fighting. It's this extraordinary contradiction where the Obama administration could both be bombing jihadist elements in northern Syria and also heavily supporting and arming jihadist elements in northern Syria. It's quite schizophrenic, but that's what we were doing. That was... But they're the good guys. They're the good guys and the bad guys at the same time. Uh, the, it, it's one of the, the best... Well, then you're certain you've got something. They were either good or bad. We'll just kill everyone and we'll ask questions later. Exactly. One of the best illustrations imaginable of the fact that U.S. foreign policy is primarily about selling weapons. So, you know, if those weapons can be useful uh, in killing some folks, we'll do that. And if those same folks can be useful in creating chaos and destruction in northern Syria, we'll fund them and arm them at the same time. That's... Uh, that's what we were doing uh, in Syria. To some extent, that's what we're still doing now. Uh, a lot of the direct arming of jihadists in Syria did stop with Donald Trump. That is something that, that was pretty good that Donald Trump did. But we're still massively supporting the jihadist controls area, air, uh, jihadist controlled areas in Syria with humanitarian aid. So it's it's kind of interesting the way that certainly, but really every big manifestation of this jihadist threat uh, was directly linked to U.S. support. United States, I do not believe, I'm not crackpot enough to believe that there's anybody in the U.S. governing apparatus who was eager uh, or aware that 9-11 was going to happen, but those elements that eventually did 9-11 were put together, armed, and facilitated a decade or two decades prior by the United States and our Saudi allies. And it's never going to be fully documented, thanks to uh, SEAL Team 6, who killed the last guy who could have actually uh, tell us the truth about this, Osama bin Laden. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll never really know just how directly involved the Saudi government was with the... Um, attacks on 9-11, but it's in publicly available knowledge. It's pretty clear that it was an attack carried out primarily by Saudi Arabians under the leadership of a Saudi Arabian in service to Saudi Arabian state ideology by an organization that was founded and funded primarily by Saudi Arabians and other Gulf kingdoms. So, so that's 9-11. And then you look at the big push that 
we experienced recently uh, as adults, uh, uh, the 2014-2015 push, uh, the Islamic State, the Islamic State simply would not have existed if the United States and again our Gulf allies and Turkey had not poured so much money into creating a jihadist free fire zone in northern Syria. So it was always kind of manufactured. Just seemed to be a huge power vacuum got filled with the Islamic State. It, absolutely, uh, and I think that might even undersell it a little bit. We we actively well also you have to understand Iraq. Obviously, um, Saddam Hussein was a horrible man, mm-hmm. but kept things under control. So once he was taken away, and Syria is also in a horrendous shape, it does create a power vacuum for some horrific people. Very true. Very true. And again, horrific people we were actively arming. So you know, I think a lot of the people in the Obama administration actually believe this, or at least most of them. The self delusion, which is just sort of looking at the the collections of militias that were active in northern Syria in that period from say two thousand eleven until twenty seventeen when we were actively funding them and being like, No, 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 you, you have to understand we're funding um, the army of the religious extremism dawn, a guy who's fighting on that front line. We're not funding Al Nusra or Al Qaeda that is literally sitting right next to him, you know, uh, getting handed ammunition by the guy we're funding. It's just this incredible. There's a lot of, if you recall, coverage of the Syrian civil war. The the complexity really came through. Is you have to understand, there's all these different militias. And certainly there are many reasons why there were all these different militias, but one of the main reasons there were all these different militias was to provide plausible deniability for U.S., CIA, and and Gulf actors and Turkish actors uh, that wanted to fund jihadists but didn't want to give money directly to al-Qaeda or the Islamic State. Uh, so yeah, it was it was a it was a void that that uh, power vacuum that was filled, but we also we're giving money to a lot of really nasty elements, a lot of nasty elements that we were telling the U.S. public that we were actively fighting to fill that void. So, yeah, it's just all, all in all, it was pretty grim. And I, I don't know, maybe, you know, we, I think we've got some younger listeners to this uh, on this podcast. Uh, it's it was a really intense environment around Islam, around Islamic fundamentalism in the United States pretty much, and Europe as well, pretty much from 2001 until really 2018 or so. Have you noticed it um, calming down much in America? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, do you do you not feel it's coming down in, in Europe? Um, I do think it has, but ov- obviously there's also less attacks, which were, you know, great um, fear-mongering fodder. And, and those are... Those are those attacks were real and those attacks were horrible and they were also largely generated by uh, U.S. and Gulf and Turkish support for a war in Syria. And uh, I can see why those, those, those built such resentment. And of course, Europe is t- continuing to struggle with migration issues. And I think large uh, Muslim populations are tied in with that in ways that might make negative feelings more sustainable in Europe? Does that make any sense, Rory, or am I... Yeah, but I do uh, agree with your statement that things are definitely... They've reached their uh, their high watermark. There seems to be more... It almost feels like, okay, we can focus on Russia again. Enough of the sideshow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, th- I think that's very much the reason why it's just completely fading away when we talk about media approaches. There's a whole galaxy, I'm sure you're uh, more familiar with these uh, actors in the United States, but I'm sure they exist in Europe as well. Uh, oh, what was the actor? What was that guy? Tommy Davidson or something? I remember it's some British. Tommy guy. Robinson? That's it. I remember some British guy. You know, these is entrepreneurs of Islamophobia. Well, there was a, there was a famous case with a grooming gang who were nearly all Muslim. But the thing is, sadly, there's a lot of grooming gangs. But Tommy Robinson never seemed to talk about ones that were like predominantly Christian or white. Those grooming gangs you forgot about and you focus purely on this, you know, mostly Muslim grooming gang. Well, and also I think it's uh, I don't think it's it's certainly well established. uh, Think about in the United States and and well established in pop culture that 
a recent group of immigrants is going to be involved in crimes. I mean, it's an actual established figure, uh, established genre in U.S. popular culture, the idea of Italian Americans being involved in organized crime, that sort of thing. So it, it wouldn't shock me if uh, immigrant communities were more likely to be involved in uh, some nefarious things occasionally. And by and large, it seems like... But quite often, you know, these people will find ways around it. I remember in Sweden, there was a whole thing about, oh, immigrants are shooting whoever. And it was implied that these were recent immigrants, but it turned out they were like second generation. And it was like slow, low tier drug dealing. But it's like, good enough. Oh, look, all these immigrants are coming from the Middle East and they're killing everyone. Oh, yeah, no question. It's it's uh, terribly exaggerated. It's interesting. And this is something that's faded. Like five years ago, Rory, I wouldn't go a day without somebody, you know, I'm embarrassed. I can't even, I can't even, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. Is it Rotherham or something where the, where the, the grooming gangs were? R-O-T-H-E-R? Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't go two days without somebody screaming that at me in my YouTube comments. Well, the, weirdly, the BBC did do a documentary on that that did make you despise these people, and it caused a terrorist attack. A man from Wales was so angry, he drove mm -hmm. to London, and he ran over some people outside of a mosque. Oh, Jesus. So quite often, obviously, that you know, those were despicable people, but then it's, you know, it's added to the whole religion when, sadly... Grooming gangs are all too common. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a terrible thing. Uh, but what's interesting is that there were these entrepreneurs, the Tommy Robinsons, the there's organizations in the United States like Jihad Watch, or uh, there's a whole galaxy. Was it Bridget Gabriel? Is that one? I can't remember. There was a whole galaxy of these characters. But I also think uh, Brexit tied into it um, in a big way. Two. Well, obviously you had the migrant crisis, as it was called, was taking off. And then the other thing I know. Turkey isn't usually included in these things, but the whole big threat was Turkey's joining the <laughs> EU. And then every Turk, you know, what is it, 60 million uh, Turks? So it's like basically 60 million Turks will be coming around next year. We need a nip out right now. Even though I think there's like fifth, there's like 15 things you have to tick to join the EU. And Turkey's ticked one. I think Turkey would be very open to ticking more, but I don't think the European Union is uh, open. It's hard to know. I think Erdogan maybe doesn't want so much transparency. Yes, yes. Uh, but I, it, it, we, we, we can agree that the Brexit campaign was lying ridiculously by implying that... But it's very likely that, you know, you're talking about um, Islamophobia. It's very likely the UK would still be in the EU if it wasn't for all this fear-mongering around and Muslims. It, it, I think it's a, it's a point that I make often, but can't make often enough. Brexit would not have happened if the refugee crisis created by U.S. policy in Syria and Libya had not been a choice that uh, the United States made. But what I wanted to say about these entrepreneurs who were very successful, uh, highlighted in a lot of media sources, like, why do I even know who Tommy Robinson's name is? Why do I know about our Stephen Yaxley Lennon, I think his real name is. Um, but uh, but why do I even know about like there was some preacher in Florida who was going to burn the Quran? The reason I know about this stuff is because U.S. media used to prioritize this sort of thing. They just it just doesn't anymore um, because, as you said, they've got Russia and China now, uh, and I. It can be overstated the extent to which U.S. media answers to the dictates of uh, the Pentagon or the military industrial complex more generally, but, uh, but it can also be understated. Uh, and if the U.S. government is no longer as interested in all this jihad stuff uh, and is more interested in Russia panic or China panic, uh, we just don't we just don't hear about it so much anymore. Well, can I throw a little uh, tinfoil hat in, if that's okay? Throw, throw in some tinfoil hat. I, I, I maybe. Um... Okay. Um, have you heard much about the effects of um, uh, leaded petrol or gasoline on the human brain? Uh, oh yeah, that's uh, one of my favorite uh, explanations for the massive crime wave of the 1970s, 1980s. Though I've recently heard that uh, that may be being debunked to some extent, but uh, uh, okay. But it's yeah, lead lead makes people crazy. Yes, because if you look sort of generally where a population brings in, um, you know, lead controls and then phases out leaded petrol or leaded gasoline, you notice 20 years later, the crime rate drops. Weirdly, 
for the troubles in Ireland, nineteen I think nineteen seventy one was like the highest lead levels, and it was also the most violent time in the troubles. Oh, wow. the lead was banned in nineteen ninety nine, and the Good Friday Agreement, which is sort of seen as the end of the troubles, was nineteen ninety eight. <laughs> and they also think that the region that will be that's bringing in these bans last is the Middle East. So there's a theory that. Hopefully, it'll be more peaceful in the decades to come. But that's my uh, tinfoil hat. Well, here's hoping. <laughs> here's hoping. I think it's, that's not super tinfoil hat. I think there are studies supporting the idea that lead, uh, lead specifically, uh, does screw people up and drive them. It's also seen as why America. Yeah, you talk about the crime wave. Why there were so many serial killers in the seventies and. 60s. Yeah. Uh, well, I uh, one of my favorite epithets for baby boomers is I call them the lead adult baby boomers. Um, and I, I think we'll, we'll all be better off as a society when these lead adult baby boomers like Donald Trump are no longer in power. Well, there's definitely um, something to that. I think around the Industrial Revolution, there was a hell of a lot of chemicals going about. Um, something that always struck me was, are you aware of mother's cordial? So basically, you know, women traditionally would have stayed in um, the house. So once they were getting jobs in factories, mm -hmm. they weren't there to look after the children. So there was a concoction. I've heard different things. It's either whiskey or like a opiate of some description. And you would just give that to the child and that would just zombify them for six hours or whatever long a day was. And then you'd come home and sort them out. So I mean, that sounds barbaric, but it's not like we've stopped over medicating children, at least in the United States. I don't know. I don't know what the approach in Europe is, but I think we're with the. I sort of think with more regulation and understanding, DDT isn't good for you. It's <laughs> going to take generations for that to get out of people's systems and bring us to almost a, a normal level. Yeah, I, I think there's there's uh, probably probably some truth there. To get back to the Islamic uh, fundamentalism thing, I think one of the, or just how differently it's treated in media is, do you remember the Salman Rushdie thing? I've heard of it, but I don't know the full details. And that in and of itself is remarkable because you're a, you're a, you're a fairly savvy news consumer. You, you keep on top of it and you, you're not even aware of what happened. So Salman Rushdie back in the 1980s wrote a book called The Satanic Verses that was condemned by the Iranian government, uh, the uh, Iranian Free Theocracy. They issued a fatwa. The guy had to live in hiding for decades. Over the past 10 years or so, I think the sense had, had developed that things had kind of blown over. He started appearing in public more. And then, you know, I can't even myself, I can't even remember if this was two months ago, three months ago, six months ago. Uh, he was giving a book talk, I believe, in upstate New York and some deranged loser of the, presumably of the Shia fundamentalist persuasion, attacked him, stabbed him. Um, and I think he might have lost use of one of his eyes. Thankfully, he survived. But if this had happened in 2015, everybody in the US and European worlds, every, well, every media consumer in the United States and Europe would have known chapter and verse about this attack that took place, who this attacker was, what the potential connections were to Iran, the life story of the attacker. Uh, it would be used to fearmonger left and right. Can our authors speak in public anymore? And it, a bit like the Charlie Hebdo attack. Well, yes, yeah, very, very. Much. I mean, obviously, Charlie Hebdo was a much larger lo loss of life, but I, I think that. With the salience of Salman Rushdie, a guy who has been seen as a, a prime victim of radical Islam being, you know, for, for decades, that's been what he's been known as primarily. And to have him be attacked, yeah, it absolutely would have been a Charlie Hebdo scale media event if U.S. media was still interested in radical jihadism, you know? Um, and it, that I find that that was really kind of stunning to me because even I mean, the United States is still pretty interested in fear mongering and creating hatred against Iran. That's still a focus. Uh, but oh, yeah, yeah. But even with that, even with the Iranian angle, it just didn't it just didn't take off. And if I were like a Tommy Robinson or a Jihad Watch, I'd be looking at this and be like, if you weren't in jail. Oh, is he? I don't, I don't know. 
Um, he does a lot of badness. But if I were, you know, one of those Islamophobia entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, I'd be like, oh, crap. It's actually one of the most satisfying things I think about is just like uh, how sad it is to be uh, is, uh, an Islamophobia entrepreneur who back in 2015 was getting invited on. Was making big dollar. Oh, wait, yeah, well, I mean, geez, I mean. Well, the amount of money you were getting from the likes of YouTube alone. Of course. Well, it, it was so back before the, what is it, the adpocalypse they talk about? So everybody was terrified of Muslims and you were making good money on YouTube doing it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, even slightly more mainstream figures like uh, Sam Harris. He's like even kind of like a left-leaning guy. Uh, and he he was like, well, I'm going to get in on this. And it, it really helped grow his podcast platform uh, by being, oh, no, Islam really is different and bad and evil. Um, and there, because there was money in it, because it's, it's, there was a lot of support from the U.S. government, from the U.S. media more generally, in creating fear of Islam. And it's just, it's just sort of faded away, which is beautiful, frankly. Uh, starting out this channel... It was, that they'll be left to their own devices without this uh, superpower meddling? Yeah, well, it's... It, Quite as much. We'll not say they're totally gone. Oh, they're not gone at all. Because there's still American troops in... Um, the likes of Syria? Oh, all, all over the Middle East. Uh, just, just read a video on that. But, the, but at least the incredible investment in creating hatred of Islam is largely gone. It's funny, when somebody crops up in my YouTube comments now uh, spouting some nonsense about the natural evil of Islam, I, I almost get nostalgic at this point because I'm like, oh. That's adorable. Like 2015 called and and wants uh, wants your brainwashing. Wants, wants the hot take. Wants, back. Yeah, wants its brainwashing back. Uh, but it, it it's really now I can already see uh, some listeners being like, oh, Islam's still this incredible threat. But but keep in mind what we said earlier. Like it, it's it's you know Islam's still this incredible threat, and you know just because the Pentagon's moving on doesn't mean it's not scary anymore. Um, and but just. A review in 9-11 and in the 2014-2015 Islamic State boom, um, both of these were events that were largely generated by the extraordinarily artificial uh, West-created uh, problem of uh, radical, is radical Islam. Like the 9-11 and the Islamic State boom were both the reactions or responses or results of U.S. foreign policy, Afghanistan in the 1980s, and the Get Assad project uh, of the of in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. Um, were there any Islamic countries that were left alone by America? Left alone in like Turkmenistan, that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, I, it depends on how you codify influence, uh, U.S. influence. I continue to be rather quite firm in my belief that Saudi Arabia is essentially a U.S. colony. And it was established by the British Empire to avoid rewarding uh, the people that... Well, there's plenty of straight lines, which is generally a tip that the Brits were involved. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, but yeah, the Brits supported the... Um, supported the Saudi royal family to rip off the, the I believe it was the Hashemites, a different uh, royal clan that was likely to be much more legitimate and accepted by the urban Arab populations. Uh, so to screw them over, uh, they supported Saudi Arabia, was established for that purpose. And then the United States has maintained uh, Saudi Arabia more or less since the 1940s because it's the weakest possible actor to get oil from. Um, so Saudi Arabia, in my mind, is... But also strange things like a lot of tech and the stock market is then funded by the Saudis. So it's almost like the Americans are saying, we're going to buy your oil, we'll invest in you, but you have to you know, pay, pay us back. Oh, for sure. That's a, long, that's a long established dynamic. But to your question, there are many Arab countries that the U.S. has not had a direct... Uh, impact on, but there are no Muslim countries, not just no Arab countries, but there are no Muslim countries that made it through the 20th century without extreme negative effects of Saudi ideology. 
Uh, the uh, I think we I think our next podcast is a Saudi podcast, so I don't want to get too far into it. But the Saudi special, yeah, Saudi special. But but in the 20th century, the wealthiest from the 1940s to up until really up until Turkey and Indonesia and Malaysia started developing in a big way in the 1990s or even in this century. Uh, Saudi Arabia was the biggest thing going in the Muslim world, and they had a really, really gross, extreme version of Islam that they imposed on everybody. And this is uh, this has led to a, a lot of damage across the Muslim world and the creation of a lot of completely unnecessary radicalism that was not indigenous to the kinds of Islam that were being practiced in those countries. So, yeah, I, I would say that no um, Muslim country has been free of uh, U.S. influence because U.S. influence has been not just a support, but in, in a real sense, the creation of worldwide Islamic fundamentalism. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's grim. But it's also the fact that, you know, every religion, you can find extremist parts and then base your whole country around you know, these incredibly niche, cruel things within your holy text, but it feels like, you know, most countries find a nice uh, a medium where they can, you know, live their lives with dignity and still, you know, honour honor their God, while it does seem that Saudi Arabia, with America's help, has been able to uh, uh, push a very um, cruel interpretation of holy texts. Well, that's one of the really great things about how wealthy Turkey, Indonesia, and Malaysia have become. Uh, and even I mean, even Bangladesh has looked pretty good over the past decade. Uh, and uh, allowing those uh, countries, those countries being able to take back control of their own versions of Islam from the really malign uh, Saudi version is uh, tremendously positive and is one of the reasons why uh, this whole embarrassing failed dynamic of radical Islamic fundamental fundamentalism is fading away, uh, is because uh, Saudi leadership is being steadily supplanted by Indonesian, Malaysian, uh, Turkish uh, leadership of the Muslim world, uh, which is a very good thing. But also there's, there's like a broader dynamic. I, I was reading recently the history of anarchism, uh, or specifically anarchist terrorism, in the late 19th and early 20th century. It's actually really fascinating because it's very similar in a lot of ways. Uh, you had uh, these folks, I don't know, vaguely left-leaning, vaguely their own thing, uh, hard to describe, but it was in the 1890s, I think, and the early 1900s, it was, I think there was a little bit of, I don't know if there was about suicide bombing, but primarily it was bombings and assassinations. And they racked up this extraordinary uh, list of assassinations. I think uh, uh, one U.S. president or a couple of U.S. presidents, uh, a Russian czar, the uh, empress of Austria, all manner of more democratically elected uh, officials in uh, Western Europe, uh, just and it, it was this this incredible um, uh, international cause celeb. Everyone was terrified of anarchists. Anarchists are coming for you. They're, 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 they're terribly scary. Uh, it's you know. Do you remember the? I don't know if you if Mad Magazine made it over to uh, uh, Europe as much, but have you ever heard of Spy versus Spy? I've no parts of it thanks to the simpsons have you ever heard have you ever heard of spy versus spy does that ring a bell i've heard the name but i, I wouldn't know anything about the the comic it's this itself. great image you can you uh it's basically this these two spies sort of cartoon figure spies is it one has a bomb behind their back and the other has a knife exactly they're constantly it's basically a black spy and a white spy and they're constantly trying to kill each other and I think that, that that is sort of an echo of a much more serious pop cultural vision of the anarchist bomber or terrorist or agent. I think Joseph Conrad wrote a book called The Ancient, The Agent, which was sort of about that as well. Um, and so Spy versus Spy is sort of the, the pop culture descendant of that image, but it was a very real image, a very real figure of horror, very real boogeyman, and they, oh, we're going to have to deal with this forever, and da 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 
And it really just burnt itself out because it was fundamentally kind of a stupid ideology and a stupid movement you know it was based on this idea that oh if we kill people and we're horrible you know through propaganda of the deed we're going to make a big difference and after about a decade of this uh they realized that the main difference they were making was making things worse uh for their left-wing causes <laughs> you know it created more repression and disaster and despite all the u.s support despite all the the cia uh, skullduggery, uh, the Saudi uh, grossness and support. I don't doubt that there were people who, and still are people, who seriously believe in these Islamic fundamentalist ideas, uh, the radical jihadism, takfirism, what have you. But really, just over the past 20 years, I also I think it's kind of similar to uh, turn of the last century anarchism. It's just a dumb ideology that's kind of burning itself out and it's only United States funding or Gulf funding or Turkish funding that actually allowed it to have that second big burst around the Syrian civil war. Um, I think it's just an ideology that's naturally burning itself out. And literally killing itself? Quite literally, quite literally. I think probably before we, before we move on, it's probably worth talking a little bit about Africa and jihadism in Africa, um, because it seems like that's a place where uh, jihad is still alive and well, or at least that's where U.S. media wants to keep telling us that jihad is alive and well. Um, and I think that, I think the story is a little more complicated than that. Where would be the most common places for this? Places like South Sudan, Chad, Nigeria? That sort of place? Nigeria is definitely the epicenter. Of course, Nigeria is most well known. It's like the powerhouse of Central Africa. Absolutely. Well, it's it's largely... Ex I think there was a statistic. There was more people born in Nigeria than in the European Union wow. last year. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Population projections for Nigeria, I don't really believe them. But there are claims that... Uh, China by the end, but sorry, that by the end of this century, Nigeria will be a larger country in population terms than China. I don't believe that. Well, well yeah, if it keeps at this rate, which it, it can't. Yeah, I, I, I don't believe that. But because I, I think currently Nigeria has got something like 250 million people, which I think definitely makes it the largest country in Africa, right? Well, when you consider um, uh, Libya would have been a big destination for a lot of people, which is... Um, Somewhere people will be fleeing now. I, I'm sure Nigeria is a much uh, much better prospect than it used to be. Uh, well, I, I'm even even today. I don't know. I've I had a buddy who lived in Lagos for a while, and it is a vast and intimidating place. Uh, I, I was like, oh yeah, I totally want to come visit. He was like, yeah, you should totally come visit. Uh, it'll take you. It'll it'll cost you like a thousand dollars to get from the airport. And I'm like, you know, I just I think I'm good. I think I'm good. It is a play. It is a not very secure place for Westerners, but Nigeria. It makes a New York look very tame in comparison. Oh, very much so. Very much so. But Nigeria is probably one of the more famous epicenters of jihadism in Africa because of Boko Haram. You remember the. Uh, that yes. horrible. I think it literally translated as the lads. <laughs> well, I think it's I think it's books are bad or something like that. So Boko is what oh, book. You well, know, books are bad. Yeah, but it's it's uh, <laughs> books are forbidden. In in uh, I think uh, Boko is is seen as more broadly Western knowledge, and Haram is is forbidden. Uh, so Boko Haram is, was a huge international issue. They are terribly savage. And they famously kidnapped a lot of women, uh, I think 2015 or thereabouts. Yeah, like a whole school of children or female children. It definitely... Were kidnapped. Definitely so the, uh, hundreds. something that they do. So Boko Haram, really horrible, really evil. But the interesting thing is that Boko Haram itself seems to have been largely defeated. The leader of Boko Haram at the time of its biggest international notoriety... Uh, wa apparently killed himself to avoid being captured by another group of uh, jihadists. These folks, I think, go under the name of Islamic State in the West African province. Um, so there is real jihadism. There is real. There are real militias in Africa, but it is a vast, vast 
region. And I... Well, to give context, Nigeria is roughly the size of the Iberian Peninsula. I think it kind of looks like Spain and Portugal together, and it's very similar size. And when you consider all the land around it that will also be influencing it, you know, these um uh, these terrorist organizations aren't aren't going to not exploit a border if they have the opportunity to. Yeah, exactly. And that's been... But also the huge amount of, um, you know, oil there creating all this wealth and tension. For sure. For sure. As well as a few um, uh, not so kind uh, European and American oil companies. That Nigeria has a, a vast range of challenges. And I think that's something that's important to talk about in the region more broadly is that even, or in, just in Nigeria specifically, Boko Haram and the jihadist problem in the north is a very real problem, but there are also a range of other ethnicities, groups, uh, militias that are also fighting against the Nigerian state that have much less of an axis towards uh, international jihadism or what have you. Uh, going back to the formation of the state and the, uh, was it the war in Biafra was a, was a big deal in the 1960s. Uh, so there's at least, I was looking into it a little bit, uh, it, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe at some point in the 2030s I'll devote a year to trying to understand Nigeria. Um, but just taking a glance at it, there's like at least four or five separate large-scale insurgencies. Boko Haram is just one of them. Was that because they they were able to fit, you know, Islamic terrorism narrative when these other groups are maybe, you're not in at the moment, uh, we'll maybe come back to you in 20 years. <laughs> I think that's I think that's very true. And what's interesting is some of these other groups... Oh, you're Christian terrorists. Sorry, they're they're very um, last. Yeah, season. you're not. You're, you're you're not in fashion. I think actually fashion has a lot to do with it, and that's really what we're talking about in general in this podcast. Is just that the fashion for focusing on Islamic fundamentalism is fading away, and you can see that directly. France has arguably never left uh, West Africa uh, from the time. Yet still doing a little bit of empire trimming. Exactly. And the justification for that French presence for the past decade has been, oh, we're fighting jihadism. And now the growing justification for French and U.S. action there is going to be, oh, we're fighting Russia or Wagner. Wagner's there. Wagner, Wa Wagner has taken over a Central African Republic, a country of five million people. And that justifies a massive U.S. and French presence for the other, you know, what, four, four or five hundred million people in the uh, region. Uh, that is, of course, a, a completely different kettle of worms. But I, but I want to emphasize that I've got a video coming out pretty soon talking about this. Uh, it's my, my next video, in fact. It's just sort of what exactly is the U.S. doing in Africa? Is that it is such a broad range of conflicts. What I would argue they kind of are is conflicts of state formation. This is sort of these countries becoming countries and well because a lot of the original borders would have just been made up by an englishman in a in a room in england somewhere like i'm saying very true, you know, with very the likes true. of chad and niger a lot of very straight lines it's almost as if they were drawn by yes. a ruler aren't yes. going to be you know feasible or natural well, in years I, to come and as you say it almost feels like i think that just i think kind that... of pedantic no we don't want these nations to naturally form and get along and be happy and prosperous. We're going to keep this bizarre, artificial, I, you know, Britain might have drawn it up to annoy France. <laughs> and now a whole nation just has to put up with it. That's a valid critique. But the thing is, a lot of these borders have now been there for uh, over a century, both in terms of uh, in imperial times and post-imperial times. And as we saw with probably the most famous example of let's correct a border, over the past decade is probably South Sudan. Uh, the, the South Sudanese are free, and even as skeptical of that as I have become, I still concede that, yeah, it was definitely the right thing to do, and that was one of the more... Well, it, it was a massive country. It was the largest in Africa before the separation, and it's almost like you kind of smooshed together Germany, France, and a little bit of Austria. Like, it is a huge mass so it does make sense that it would inevitably well and, and break apart specifically with the the character of the populations there you had the uh it was a country that was built to harvest slaves from the south 
uh, with the northern Arab populations being the slave mongers and then the folks in the south being the, the slave hunting grounds. So it's one of the most natural splits I can imagine. Uh, even even today, it, it's this was probably the right thing to do. And the first thing that happened after independence in 2013 or 2014 is that South Sudan fell into one of the worst wars of the century so far. I think estimates, the, no one will ever get good numbers on this, but I think it's it's probably safe to say that more people died there than died in Syria, and it's not even really that resolved, uh, the conflict. I think. But revolutions are an incredibly difficult thing and often lead to civil wars. Sure, but what, I, what I'm saying is more broadly is that I'm not necessarily for revising borders. I think you're going to get horrible wars regardless, whether you're, you've got, as you've got in Nigeria, uh, one population sort of centralizing and warring against a whole bunch of other populations to consolidate, but also if you're just like, ah, split it up, you might actually get more and worse wars. So I think what's going on in that is called international jihadism, literally every six months for the past five years, The Economist or The Wall Street Journal, these are sort of some of the more right-leaning news outlets, uh, will run an identical story. I feel like I've read this story at least three times in The Economist, uh, at least a couple times in The Wall Street Journal. Uh, this story that says, jihadism's new front is in Africa. Like, th this is a new thing that has been sold as a new thing since at least 2015. And what these publications are, of course, doing is justifying the vestigial churn of money and whatnot uh, that's going on uh, for the military industrial complex in Africa. Uh, and it's so half-hearted. They're not even like putting much many resources into this. They just generally, and I really do think this happened, uh, every six months, the US president is obligated to send Congress a very half-assed report, very half-assed report about where US troops are involved in combat. And in this six-month iteration, he had to divulge that we didn't have to, but he kind of politically had to divulge that we had dramatically stepped up the amount of U.S. troops, not in Nigeria, but in Niger, uh, the country next door. So I really do think the Wall Street Journal put out this article saying, oh, the new front of jihad is in, uh, in North Africa and in Niger specifically. Um, they put out this article specifically uh, to help cover for the Biden administration and the Pentagon for having this really, frankly, inexplicable 50% rise in U.S. troop levels in Niger. Um, so these articles keep coming out. And like what I would argue is that actually what's nominally called jihad in um, North Africa, the Sahel region, is to some extent there are real jihadists. There are a lot of opportunistic militias who have chosen to associate themselves with interesting brands like the Islamic State. Um, but much more broadly, what these wars are that the United States is participating in and exacerbating by heavily funding these centralized militaries um, are wars of state formation. So we're kind of supporting the the petty massacres and evils that form nations. And I go back and forth on whether or not those evils have to happen, but I am pretty unambiguous in thinking that the United States should not be funding them. <laughs> you know, like Niger, Nigeria, Central African Republic, these folks are going to figure out how they're going to exist, what their the nature of their countries are going to be, the United if the United States could intervene in a in such a way as to make that a less violent process, then by all means let's do that. Let's definitely keep sending as much aid money as we can and sending Ivy League kids to talk about conflict resolution or what have you. But that's not what we've been doing for the past decade. We've been primarily we've had a military first approach to all of North Africa under the guise of the war on terror. And that's why these articles keep talking about, about this brand new jihad we've told you about for the past decade running is to justify, yeah, to justify this military first approach to a range of problems in Africa that are actually not jihad at all.
So are you hoping that this should bring peace to the continent? Or I know it's not a continent, the the wider Islamic world? Uh, yeah, normally I'd say absolutely not. But I don't, I, you know, I, I do see some reasons for hope or stabilization. I see no real hope of the United States pulling its military bases out. But I do think there's been efforts in Africa specifically to just pull back our funding of all these militaries. Uh, so yeah, the, 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 the gradual slowing down and ending of the war on terror is definitely something to be celebrated. Uh, a lot of the impacts of it, U.S. basing, uh, militarization of everything, are, are going to hang around. But if if the intensity of the global war on terror and the uh, freaking out about all this jihadism we've created, uh, if all of that was just dialed back a notch, yeah, I do think it's possible to be cautiously hopeful about that. And if you want to know more about specifically the question of jihadism in Africa, I would recommend subscribing to my YouTube channel. My next produced video uh, is going to grapple with that at length. Uh, and it really does play into this, this strange theme of fading jihad. The More Freedom Foundation is also available on YouTube and TikTok. Rob's Twitter is RobOLaw, and he's also written a book called Avoiding the British Empire, What It Was and How the US Can Do Better, and music provided by Kevin MacLeod. Uh, 